Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we have an hopefully interesting session uh, about different ideas you might want to pursue on the PermaWeb. Ah, is that cut off? Okay, well, hopefully it's just that slide. I don't use the bottom of the, the screen much. Um, yeah, so the idea here is that uh, if you haven't already identified um, something you'd be interested in building on top of the network. We have you know, literally dozens of these um, floating around that we've been discussing for years. And I think there's a huge amount of value to be captured in just pursuing some of them. So um, yeah, we can go through those ideas and you can either pick them up straight away and start using them, or you know, hopefully they inspire something else inside you that says, oh, okay, that, that was cool, but what about if we do it slightly like this? And you, know, you make it even better. So at the bottom there, this is the, the poem of Greenfield. Uh, we got this nice Windows XP 2003 era background. Okay, let's go. So one idea, and this is really remarkably obvious. Um, people in the NFT space uh, are using, I would say, largely centralized infrastructure at the moment. Um, it started, you know, when NFTs first became popular in about January this year. They really started to uh, to grow in popularity. Um, with people using centralized storage for the NFTs themselves. This was you know, absolutely terrible because basically, obviously the link inside, it will eventually break if it's on the centralized web because the person um, paying for the service will be the stop paying. The, the person providing the service will uh, move the data potentially at some point um, or the company that is providing, uh, yeah, providing the the resources like AWS or whatever it happens to be will eventually change their offering and the thing will go down. Or if none of that happens, eventually someone will forget to pay for the bill for the DNS name that associates you know, the domain name uh, with the server location. So, so this is a really, really bad problem. We, we spoke about this uh, previously. Okay, so the industry has started to address that, now starting to use permanent storage for the data um, for the assets of the NFTs themselves, that's great. Uh, but still, when you go to these websites where you buy and sell your NFTs, and particularly where they gain their liquidity from, they're, they're basically centralized. Um, and this is almost uniform. There's, there's one exception, which is Holoplex, which uses Arweave to deploy uh, Metaplex front ends. Um, for the, the storefronts, but that, that's the only one. Everything else is, is completely centralized. Um, that goes like OpenSea um, and all the stuff in the Solana ecosystem too, actually. All of those websites can just go down, like FTX just started uh, an, F, yeah, an NFT exchange, which is great, but you know, if you lose that, you kind of lose the liquidity. So a great perma web application would be a trustless liquid NFT exchange. It's, it's very simple to build. It's, it's just a perma web application. So idea number one. Number two, liquid NFT platforms. So we didn't discuss this in the session yesterday about NFTs on Arweave, but I think there's a big opportunity to uh, essentially pool liquidity for NFTs. One of the big problems uh, with the NFT space at the moment is that uh, you might buy an NFT and then potentially no one in the future wants to buy it from you. And so you, you've just kind of sunk money, essentially. They're, they're very illiquid and subsequently inefficient markets. So what we can do instead is we can say, okay, well, we could have, for example, a community token associated with the set of NFTs, and then people stake against the NFT in that collection. And they outstake each other. And when they do so, the, the tokens of the person that, that previously had the NFT return to that person's wallet. And so what this means is it, imagine you want to you know, get be the owner or the sponsor of um, some kind of NFT gorilla, right? And, and I'm staking a thousand tokens against that gorilla. Um, you coming along and you want to say, okay, to me, it's worth 1,100 tokens. Okay, you stake those one, oh, first you have to buy them, uh, the community's token, the gorilla tokens, I guess in this case, uh, on an exchange, and you have to stake those tokens. And when you do so, my 1,000 tokens are returned to me, and I can go sell them to someone else. And of course, if you have 10,000 gorillas, well, now that gorilla community token is actually pretty liquid. 
fundamentally solves one of the problems of NFTs. Oh, and it also means if you just want to invest in the collection of NFTs, the gorillas, uniformly, then great. Now you can do so through a liquid, uh, a liquid tokenized asset. So I, I think that can be really interesting. Um, the only implementation of this I've seen in practice is actually the R wiki. So on the R wiki, if you want to sponsor a uh, page and get your name at the bottom that says, you know, this page kindly sponsored by blah, 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 your address or, or your, your name with virtual ID, I think is important. Um, in order to do that, you have to play this game where you buy the R wiki token and you stake it and you, know, you have to stake each other and you can sell it. It's a liquid NFT essentially. But that's the only platform I know of. I don't think there's anyone that's done this for gorillas. So that could be pretty interesting and pretty cool. Truthiness markets. So um, everything on the perma web is to some extent an assertion of truth. It's this person has asserted this thing at this time. And it might be a gorilla picture, like whatever it happens to be. Um, but it's still kind of an assertion about a thing. It's like a statement. And, and sometimes it's a gorilla, but other times it's, you know, um, if it's Redstone data feed, for example, it's the price of Bitcoin. It's an assertion. Um, you are saying that the thing is true. Well, it would be really cool if we could attach to transaction IDs or, you know, a piece of news or a blog post or, you, know, or you, you get the idea. There's, there's a, uh, yeah, a whole section for which this is much more uh, relevant. Um, yeah. It would be great if we could attach to any transaction ID on the perma web a market for whether we believe it's true or not. And there's a ton of different ways this mechanism could work. But broadly speaking, it's something like you stake against either side. And over time, the, st the, high, the side with a higher stake gains some of the stake of the lower side. And you can also do interesting, weird dynamics about like the longer you stake on something that people previously believed was untrue, which then they started to believe was true later, uh, the, the greater your, your participation in the rewards or, or something along these lines. There's a bunch of different mechanisms, but because everything in the Tumble web is associated you know, with a, a timestamp, uh, it doesn't go anywhere, uh, and it can have these tags which start smart contracts in, in an atomic way associated with the data, uh, in, in just like in the same way we spoke about atomic NFTs yesterday. There's a big, yeah, there's a big opportunity here to, to explore stuff you couldn't do on a centralized web very easily. Decentralized social media. This is one of the things I think is most uh, profound about uh, the perma web. At the moment, when you use social media, which has arguably become the public square of the digital age, you, um, you kind of have two layers of filtration, right? There's the layer that we all agreed to when we chose what country to live in or what have you actually whether we were born but we at least you know in the west we, we take part in democracy to choose how they are governed um there's the government tells us what we can or can't say and then on top of this there is now private companies that tell us what they can or what we can or cannot say and they do so um in a way that's fairly arbitrary it's just based on basically their beliefs um and they don't answer to anyone other than their board members and, and shareholders um it changes all the time and so it's difficult to keep up with. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's profit motivated. So on YouTube, it or the, the example I always use because it's, I'd say, probably one of the least political, I'm afraid it is slightly political uh, still, is, is the question of where the COVID-19 origins came from. Was it, did it come from a lab or, or did it occur naturally in, in nature? Um, now, that doesn't matter where you fall on that question or whether you're in the middle camp, which is, we don't know, but both options seem possible. Um, but there was a time where if you tried to speak about this on Facebook, for example, your, your account would be banned. Like you, would, you would be not just censored from saying this one particular thing, and they would do it based on keyword search. So not even, um, you know, checking whether what you were saying about it was uh, true or false. It was just that you mentioned the topic at all. So you might have said, it's idiotic that people talk about the lab leak hypothesis, for example. That, that could have got you censored as well. Um, it's that they would delete your entire account and, and subsequently, um, well, 
there's there's two ways that that's pretty diabolically bad. It's one, that is your identity. People use their Facebook account across the web uh, to log into lots of different services. If you get rid of your account, that's, that's, a, that's a disaster. Um, it's also your, your method of speech to your friends. And so you are highly, highly disincentivized from saying anything that Facebook might possibly even see as against their content policies. This is not how free speech was supposed to work in a free society where we are governed by people we select. Uh, so if you build decentralized social media systems on top of, uh, I'll leave, this is kind of one of the, one of the reasons it was built, um, you, can, you can essentially have a, a system in which the rule of law is the rule of the application. There is no layer in between where um, a private company which has all these problems associated with it is telling you what you can or cannot say. Uh, instead, it's, well, the miners in the country where you are operating, are they going to store the data? Are the gateways going to make the data available? And they won't do that if it's illegal because they're you know, telling everyone in the world what they're storing and that's just a, they're, they're massively disincentivized by the legal system from doing that. And so we can have decentralized social media networks that are exposed to the rule of law. I think this is like a really profound thing that <laughs> one way or another, we got to get built over the next uh, year or two um, as the situation on the centralized media, uh, social media uh, sites has got increasingly worse. Anyway, switching gears, IPFS uh, bridge profit sharing community. So um, there's a system on top of Arweave, which is really popular. It's actually slightly less popular now than, than it used to be because people are using you know, direct to Arweave uh, storage of their NFTs, but there was a period where this was almost all of the traffic on the network. Uh, this idea that you can uh, bridge data across from IPFS. So you can grab the data from IPFS, put it in an Arweave transaction, send it to the network, and there are nodes inside the Arweave network that will uh, repeat that data inside IPFS again, and so decentralize it uh, using Arweave. Big problem with this is, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, actually, um, these nodes are not incentivized. And to, to, to make them incentivized would be like a fairly, fairly large uh, undertaking. Now, I think that you can build a profit sharing community which uses stake and slash um, stake and slash mechanisms to kind of enforce the pinning of this. I, I don't know how you incentivize the bandwidth, but I, I think you can force the pinning through this, uh, through such a system like that. Um, yeah, and, and that's a very obvious thing that, that someone might want to take up and I think could be very valuable because it's already got a lot of usage in the ecosystem and no one is working on it at the moment. We've mailed clients. So we've mail is this decentralized email system that, that exists on top of the Arweave network. You can send uh, messages peer to peer um, and there's no Google in the middle uh, intermediating your access to your identity because of course, if you, you know, log into your Gmail account or, or you give someone your Gmail address, you're trusting Google won't deny you access to your mail server or, or, or to your mail inbox on their server, which of course they, they have to within their rights to do so. Um, which is a pretty major problem. And okay, maybe they're not gonna deny you access to your mail, but what they're sure as hell gonna do is try and find all of the possible ways to extract value from your mail. Um, you know, when uh, Gmail started in 2009, it wasn't clear that they would sell access to your data. Uh, they would sell um, well, access to your attention, essentially through marketing. All of that was to come. So yeah, we've mailed clients, uh, which enable you to to engage in conversation with people in a way that's truly trustless and peer-to-peer -peer would be amazing. There are already a couple more of these um, in existence now than you know, there were a couple of months ago, um, but I think there's, there's much more that can be done in this area. Um, permanent document uh, signatures and storage. It's pretty obvious when we have a system like DocuSign um, that, that it'd be nice to have that in a trustless way where DocuSign wasn't sitting between uh, the parties. And, and also having a permanent record of the documents that you've signed together is a useful thing to do. It's, it's timestamped, it's cryptographically verifiable, and you don't have to trust a third party. So decentralized DocuSign is an obvious and, and great use case for the network. 
decentralized video sharing and streaming platforms. Similar to uh, decentralized social media, you can see how a, a decentralized uh, version of something close to YouTube or Vimeo but would be a great fit for the Arweek network. Um, yeah, it, often people are worried about content policies here. And, and the nice thing about the network is that, well, those content moderation systems are built right into the protocol itself. So this question of, well, miners are obviously massively disincentivized by the law from storing anything that is illegal um, means that illegal data just won't make it onto the network and or at least won't be uh, stored in the network. And that means they won't be accessible via your platform. And so you actually don't need to deal with this at the application level. It's dealt with below that uh, in, a, in, a in a way that's shared across all applications. And so I think that's a really powerful uh, thing because you know it actually takes the burden off the developer of, of designing their own, well, it starts with the obvious, right? Censorship tools of all the things that we can all basically agree should and are illegal everywhere in the world. But You'll want to do that if you build a video sharing platform. Um, but then, of course, comes the question, well, what about the stuff that's more edge case? And, and you can just defer that to the protocol level underneath um, it, using the Arweave system because it, those nodes in the network have to have, to have uh, yeah, they have to have ways of dealing with that anyway. So, and, and you can also add extra layers on top if you really want to. Um, you can use the system that's like open source and is in use by the miners called Shepherd, which one of the things it does, it's a sort of different pluggable classifier. So you put a piece of data into it and it'll tell you, is it this, is it that, and so on. Um, one of those is just adult content. So you could also add just a, like a blanket adult content filter on top if you like. Anyway, lots to discuss there. Uh, we'd love to speak to anyone that's interested in it about that afterwards. Decentralized blog publishing. Medium was a great service way back in 2012, 13, 14, when we got started. Um, but it, but it, it ran the classic Web2 growth model, which meant, you know, they start off passionate founders building a cool new thing. They get a huge amount of growth because it solves a real problem. Uh, they take a lot of VC funding and, and they give away control of the organization to some extent. In the deal that they, they're essentially bankrolling that growth, such that value can be extracted later, which is a fair deal, but like not necessarily great for the user because once people are tied in, once you've told everyone, hey, you can find us at medium.com stroke our weave team or whatever it is, uh, then it's really hard for us to leave. And, and so what they did, of course, was they added paywalls. And then your, your content became, and your viewers were, uh, yeah, well, your content was denied from your viewers by a paywall that paid medium, not you. And that was added much later after the uh, the moat had been established. That was a yeah, it's it's a classic example of the problem with the Web two growth model. What if we built a decentralized blog publishing platform where, when you publish a blog, uh, you can be confident that access is not going to be denied to it later. You the the business model is is clear up front, and if the developer wants to add something to the system later, they definitely can. But they can't force you to adopt it. This is like the fundamental thing about common web applications. So if they want to, to get you to use a new version of the software, the software has to be better than the old version. Otherwise, we just keep using the old version. Cool. OK, so one of the things we've been looking at in the Arweave ecosystem for a while is this idea of forkable knowledge bases. So something along the lines of Wikipedia mixed with GitHub. GitHub has this amazing um, model where you can take any piece of code, you just press a button, now you've got a copy of that piece of code with a different name. Now you are the owner and you can do whatever you want to it. Uh, and then you can trace the fork tree back to its origin. Um, this is really interesting because it allows people to, you know, uh, permissionlessly improve stuff, or more or less permissionlessly uh, improve stuff over time in a way that, that makes most sense to them. And then People vote with their feet for which fork is actually best. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it's good for advancement of the quality of the software. What if we did that, but uh, with knowledge in, the, in a kind of um, Wikipedia-like way? And, and then once you, yeah, you could take any kind of blog post even potentially. So knowledge base like Wikipedia is, is one version, but also just blog posts or something like that. 
um, any kind of writing or news articles, even arguably, what if you could just create a fork of it and then and then publish it and have a, a viewing system that allowed you to switch between the forks and see how the knowledge has evolved over time? Um, and then potentially if people give tips to that piece of knowledge, what if those tips flow back through the fork tree as well? There's a ton of interesting stuff you can explore there. Okay, archive viewers and organizers. There's a lot of really cool archives on top of the Arweave now. In fact, at one point I started to think about Arweave more as a protocol for building archives than an archive itself. I'm not sure where I stand on that now, but, but the argument something like, well, an archive is a sort of collection of, yeah, it's a collated uh, set of fragments of knowledge or history um, that are typically about a subject in, in one form or another, even if it's a national archive, well, the subject is the nation. Um, yeah, whereas what Arweave does is it basically says, well, we shall archive the data for you in a fairly unstructured way. So you can add whatever tags you want to it, but uh, the data is not separated intrinsically into, into different buckets. So it's not like, you know, about a nation or about a sport or about the history of chocolate or whatever it is, you know, um, it, it's not set up like that. And so you could argue that the, the platform is more like a, uh, a, yeah, a protocol on which you can build archives of different types of knowledge. Um, and that there are many archives of different types of knowledge inside our, our we've now. So, you know, an obvious one is like the NFT craze of 2021. There's an unbelievably large amount of data about that now. Another is uh, from 2019, a huge archive of, of primary sources of um, documents related to the Hong Kong protests, for example. A huge number of sources around the early days of the coronavirus, for example. So these are all archives, arguably a tool that allows you to collate different transaction IDs and organize um, yeah, organize them into a way that they can be easily viewed by people, could be really useful. I think it'd be amazing if we had a viewer where people could go to see the um, those sources we have about the Hong Kong protests. And, and this is just like two years on, that was a really profound thing that changed history. Imagine what it's gonna be like 10 or 20 years down the line, um, or 100 years, 200 years down the line. So, so viewers of the archives at some point will become an important thing. I think it would be great if someone got out ahead of that and, uh, and built tools in that direction. Uh, data monetization mechanisms. This is really generic, but I think that it could be really cool if we um, yeah, build systems, or alternate systems uh, for monetizing data that's stored on the network, like paid access potentially. And you can you know, do something that's well, one obvious mechanism is you can say, okay, so there's a server that keeps keys, decryption keys for data that's stored on the network. You can, and there's a link in the tags, you can go buy access to that data uh, from that server, and then, you know, you can monetize it. Uh, now there is what Koi is doing. I mean, please don't do what Koi is doing, go use their software instead. But, um, but that's just another example of how you can monetize data. And I think there's a lot to explore in this space. I would love to speak to people that are interested in that. Uh, afterwards. Decentralized gateway networks. Uh, so on top of the Arweave network, well, the Arweave core protocol is um, is very, very, very well decentralized. It's like when you put a piece of data into it, you generally get thousands of copies of that information over time. Um, the gateway network or, or the gateways on top of that are much more centralized. They're not centralized, they're distributed is a fair way to call it. So you go to arweave.net and it's a gateway, it allows you access to the data in a web browser. You go to arweave.live, same thing, uh, gateway.rdrive.io, uh, and so on. There's a bunch of them, but they're not like, there aren't a thousand of them. It would be nice if there were. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that can be done, um, yeah, to build networks that incentivize people to run gateways, potentially application-specific gateways. And there's like, well, frankly, dozens of business models associated with this uh, that could be affected. Okay, universal permanent awareness tools. So uh, one of the things that when we were just getting started with Arweave, really before Arweave was a thing, I was spending a lot of time uh, looking at was the kind of open source intelligence networks on the internet. Um, and, and one of these 
tools that, that people had built uh, was this thing called Live UA Map, I think, uh, the Universal Awareness Map. And basically, it had a map of the world, uh, and it was updating in real time with signals about events that were happening in places. Um, and there are tons of tools like this. So, so there's also Snap Maps, uh, which basically shows you places that are dense with videos being published on Snapchat um, or live streams on Periscope, whatever it happens to be. Now, I think that one of the, yeah, there's, there's something very uh, sad happening here. Um, sorry, <laughs> one second. I'm in a hotel at the moment. This is a no thank you. <laughs> one moment. Hi, no, thank you. Oh, hi. Uh, we got... oh. No, it's all good. Thanks so much. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Um, back to it. Yeah, this is a problem with working from a hotel. Now, uh, live permanent awareness tools. So, uh, yes, there's, there's a sad thing which is happening here, which is that all of that information, which is uh, available in real time, um, is essentially lost. And that, that's kind of terrible because a lot of these uh, signals are clustered around the most important events in in the world. So, for example, in the uh, I'm not sure what you were going to call them the the protests that took place at, at minimum uh, last year, both at the the Capitol and uh, during the summer in the United States, there were a very large number of live streams of those uh, events that happened, but all of those live streams were lost. And they, those were incredible records of history. We obviously should have had a way to essentially suck up all of the data that is being publicly, you know, that's the important part, publicly published uh, to the internet from these places and kept it in prosperity, uh, posterity, pos, posterity, anyway, um, for prosperity, <laughs> that word. Um, yes, keep it for the future to be able to look back and understand uh, the the event in as great to detail as is possible, essentially. So, so I think, yeah, expanding this uh, universal awareness kind of tool set to also uh, add permanent storage would be a really profound thing to do. Okay, switching gears again, decentralized matrix network. So matrix is a really interesting peer-to-peer uh, -peer chat protocol which can replace something like Slack or Discord. Um, however, it's it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but it's, it's distributed, not decentralized, right? So, so you might go to a matrix server and, uh, and there's a few matrix servers, there's not many matrix servers. Well, I think that uh, mixing Arweave and, uh, and matrix, you can build a, a truly decentralized network that can replace D uh, Discord and Slack. The cool things about this, um, are that, yeah, they've already built really, really uh, powerful, um, yeah, really powerful UIs that, that are they're very high quality. And so you can plug into that work that has already happened. And of course, open source as well. Um, and also those communities that already exist there. So I think like, is it, uh, it's not Polygon. No, a few major crypto projects have been using uh, Matrix for a while. I know Polkadot does, uh, but a few others as well. And, and you know, those UIs are like, they're production ready. And there's a community there that already uh, kind of passionate about decentralization, but they don't have a solution for it. Well, if you mix our technologies together, then you can build one. And, and one word of uh, uh, to note about why that might be effective. Um, when you think about... Slack, for example, <laughs> half of the, the, the Western business world, maybe actually three quarters even, potentially. Some, some of them use Microsoft Teams, some of them use Slack. Uh, but across the, the Western business world, particularly since the pandemic started, essentially um, all business activity has moved online and a lot of it has moved to written text. Inevitably, there will be a day where someone <laughs> hacks into Slack, um, and I'm sure nation states have tried to do this already, 
and start to leak that information to start screwing with the business world. And when, when they start to do that, people will realize the danger of allowing a centralized organization to control all of that information. Uh, that, that can just like, completely immobilize the Western business world, I think. Um, so yeah, being ready with the solution could be a great thing. And, and ideally getting it adopted before that ever happens, but like realistically Slack is so, so, so well used, uh, that, that would be tough. But nonetheless, that's the idea. Okay, open source package managers. Yeah, when you depend on a piece of code, you want to make sure that piece of code doesn't disappear. But of course, in typical package managers, um, well, the person that uploads the code has the ability to remove it. So the left pad incident is the obvious example of this with NPM. So through a sort of massive hierarchical chain of, uh, of dependencies, something like 30 to 40%, I think, maybe it was higher, of the NPM ecosystem, which is more or less all of Node.js, um, which itself is like 30 to 40% of the whole web, <laughs> depended on this package called left pad, which just removed the spaces or tabs at the beginning of a uh, string. It's a very, very simple library. But one day, the, uh, the maintainer of left pad just deleted it. <laughs> and suddenly, everything broke. This is obviously a major problem. Uh, if you license something in a public domain license, it's fair to say that, that it, you know, well, actually, not just fair to say, but it's legally precisely the truth that other people can replicate it as much as they want. And subsequently, they can replicate it onto a permanent data storage system. Uh, that's obviously a better way to store this information so that it can't be removed or tampered with later. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that was helpful or at least inspiring um, to find you know, various different ideas that you can pursue in the ecosystem. I think there's uh, a ton of stuff that we didn't get to, but that should be enough at least to, to get the conversation started. All right, see you in the crowd.